All right, um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know what time it is over there on your side, but like, you know, right now here um, I'm in uh, Redmond. Um, and uh, good morning. Um, so my name is Keiko Harada. I'll do a little bit of an introduction later on, but today like we will be talking a lot more about like containers, observability and monitoring. One of the pieces that I wanted to actually emphasize is that with this session, it's actually more about my discovery of observability and monitoring and uh, what I've actually gone through like, you know, till today. And uh, let me actually go into the slide and actually delve a little bit deeper into like, you know, what that actually means and, you know, where things are actually changing. So, I'm sorry, different monitor. So just actually letting you know, this is just who I am. Uh, picture's extremely old now. Uh, I think it's like two years old, but um, I currently work for Microsoft. I'm a senior program manager there uh, for Azure Compute Team um, in the application platform. So uh, as you can see in my bio, um, you'll see that I actually had been um, a customer uh, working in IT for uh, financial firms um, and later on uh, moved into being more of a salesperson. So uh, when I was in Hitachi, I was a salesperson and I've also done marketing from there, like um, from a very interesting perspective. Um, you know, incident that happened, uh, they made me into a product strategist and be, become a PM. And that actually led me to uh, Microsoft today. Uh, and for those who know me and who doesn't, um, just kind of quickly, I've been in part of the Azure Monitor organization, if you know like what Azure Monitor is. And there uh, I've been incubated container monitoring products. Um, so if you know Container Insights, that's one of my products. And then of course, Container Monitoring Solutions, VMware Solutions, those are some of the pieces that I've actually done in the past as well too. So right now um, I'm more focused on the platform as I, th I see more future as, um, I'm not saying there's no future in my team, I'm saying like the future also is really significantly into mon uh, platform. So there, um, um, there I'm actually uh, working on the, uh, I'm focused on like containers right now within the compute team as part of the application platform. Okay, so, sorry, having issues here. Okay, quickly uh, on the agenda, uh, I wanted to talk about, as I've actually done my journey of monitoring in the past, I've started to realize because the platform is shifting, because of how people are doing their, uh, developing their applications, things have actually pretty much shifted. And because of these platform shift, development experience shifting, monitoring also started shifting a lot. So I'll start talking about that a little bit more. And then also a little bit into observability and monitoring. What are they, um, how different they are? Uh, and also like a little bit of observability and monitoring plays in like in an enterprise world, what I've actually seen at the enterprise customer sites when I visit them or have a discussion on how they're going through with um, containers and microservices. And also lastly, um, I'm going to talk about like observability monitoring tools that are out there that are very, very helpful. What are the key tips that I should actually look at if I wanted to have these type of tools? Um, and the other piece um, that I will also talk about is some of the trends that I've also seen as well too within this particular area. So um, again, uh, these are actually the topics um, I'm going to actually go into a little bit more and um, uh, I guess later on, I guess feel free to ask any questions. Okay. So um, as we all know, like uh, originally, like we had a lot of monolithic applications and a lot of applications were pretty much defined by vendors. Vendors actually knew, they, they had the application platforms, they actually knew what it was. And then of course, you know, because of all these um, complex, like um, the flexibility that customers required, scalability and whatnot, uh, microservices came up. Uh, of course, microservices itself does actually rely heavily on the platform itself as well too, of how you do the application modeling, um, how do you deploy uh, a microservices, like especially for distributed systems. Um, what is the failover? What's the load balancing? Um, how do I have proper reliability and whatnot? And then later on, the container came about and actually changed all this really significantly too. So some of the pieces that you had to do on microservices were you need to understand the platform, the platform SDKs, how do you embed it in your microservices? How do you actually see how distribution system actually should be? Now with containers, you've got a lot, lot more simpler and now rather than a distributed system cluster, now you have an orchestrator. And of course, you could have an orchestrator also on the microservices, but now we're seeing more and more of this with the orchestrator taking more of a role of a cluster manager. It's interesting um, when we say container um, orchestrator, people think that it's similar to a cluster manager, but honestly, um, it's not. It has some capability of a cluster manager, but again, it's actually more to schedule to make sure that these um, applications 
in a container are properly uh, load balanced, they're running um, and, and uh, you know, properly uh, loaded and whatnot. So again, this is actually the changes that we're seeing on the platform. Of course, we're not saying monolithic is gone. There's a lot of um, different type of usage that monolithic will do better rather than on a microservices and vice versa. So I'm just actually seeing some of the pieces that we're actually seeing the trend. And of course, with this trend itself, we're going to actually see that the monitoring will change. So way back when, and again, it's still like recent, but mono, uh, monolithic applications, um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of vendor defined metrics that you, you could actually use out of the box. You didn't really think about it. There might be some custom metrics that you might actually have because you're, it is your in-house application you're working on. But again, a lot of pieces uh, were pretty much defined because the vendor had the platform. Let's say for Microsoft, you have the VS code, you have the application model, and then from there you have the platform um, that you actually create. So you kind of know like what metrics are there. So the vendors would already have like um, products like application insights um, or Azure monitor metrics, whatnot, that actually provide you um, these out of the box uh, monitoring tools. However, this changed significantly. As we all know, um, with the microservice and containers, or even with the containers and orchestrators, it's all about um, open source and community. So right now, when, when I started um, containers, uh, it was the major three um, orchestrators was Docker Swarm, um, Mesos DCOS, and Kubernetes. Right now, Kubernetes dominates the market, and Kubernetes is very much open source. So within there, um, now it's actually a community play. No, the vendors doesn't understand what metrics are required because metrics can change um, and they're not something that they've actually created. So it's actually hard to actually predict. There are some basic ones, but of course there's something that you can't predict. And a lot of custom metrics are coming in, um, different type of languages, different type of platforms or framework. And of course, as the platform itself is pretty much decoupled because it's an um, orchestrator and a container, you're pretty much decoupling a little bit from the infrastructure now, like you're, you wanted to actually see what's actually happening with the in state of for observability. So here, like, and you'll see that observability has actually become very um, significant. It started taking a very significant role. Previously, for previously, we had observability. Actually, it's not like we don't have observability. We actually did, but because Honeycomb came back and said, hey, you know what? This is actually one thing that we should actually emphasize even further. And this is the reason why observability became like a buzzword like two years ago. And of course, uh, and people started to actually utilize. There's a lot of cool things that Honeycomb actually does, but again, people didn't really realize what it is. And I think now people are a lot better in terms of observability, but I don't actually see like, you know, I think it's still, people are start trying to actually adapt and still trying to understand what observabilities are. So with that said, uh, actually see like and I, I started actually putting in a slide that actually says well what is observability so this is a definition i picked up from wiki and all that so you'll see that where um, observability it's a measure of how well the internal states of the system can be inferred so this comes from like control and uh, engineering um, concepts and uh, it's pretty much like it is a property of a system it doesn't mean that you have to actually um, put an external output in there. So for observability, it could be something that you already have, like it could be like a kernel state, it could be any type of like file, file IO information and whatnot. Um, and these are stuff that we normally don't see as monitoring because um, you don't really need to see that granularity. And there's some pieces that uh, we may actually need to see it because we need to troubleshoot and see what's going on in the system because we can, regular day-to-day um, -day type of monitoring or metrics wouldn't actually um, provide better um, capabilities. And then, of course, we have monitoring here. It's actually something of what we perform against an application or system to determine the state. So again, it's something, it could be like an agent that running. Most of the time it's an agent or it could be a, like a kernel module whatnot that actually picks up through a sidecar and uh, you'll actually put um, push it into a centralized location. And um, you'll see the entire state, like it could be in metrics, of course, um, metrics, logs, um, and, you know, some other like, you know, health statuses, this goes on. So uh, we actually looked at this and we said, well, what can we do to our customers, especially for, uh, and I'm going to talk about Kubernetes because Kubernetes is the, um, the dominant of the, um, the market, especially for Kubernetes. There's a lot of stuff that people don't understand um, and it, it is all over the place. There are actually, there's Kube APIs that actually is uh, very helpful, but it's, it's still like difficult to actually understand what is it that's actually causing uh, my application to go down. So before going to a little bit in the depths of that, um, I just wanted to kind of like sh show another diagram 
that provides you like a little bit of a difference of observability and monitoring. And I put alerting on the end as well too. So here, observability, when you actually go through Google it or do any of the um, research, you'll see that it actually is from three main points. It's tracing logs and metrics. Um, and these tracing logs and metrics are not always about uh, they could be actually similar to what you have with monitoring, but overall the main thing is it's a human interaction and intuition. I could be looking into logs randomly and then see like there might be some patterns. Then it's not about I'm looking for an issue. It could be something of a pattern that I wanted to look at. Um, is there something that correlates? Should I actually be looking at it? And that could actually lead into the monitoring piece with custom metrics. But again, first thing is I'm actually developing um, an application I'm testing it. I want to actually develop it. I just want to see what's going on. Can I actually just look at it really quickly to see how it's actually running um, with just like, you know, really quickly. So this is where observability comes in. Data, as I mentioned before, it could be a state internally. It could be like a, like file IOs, like, you know, what is it actually talking to? What's the communication? It could go into really depths, like in which a tracing could actually provide. But it's not something that you really need to preserve for a long time. It could be something of 10 to 15 minutes. Or it could be 30 minutes that you just want to actually see and test it out left and right. Yeah. And it's there to actually answer your questions of like, you know, what it's as you actually develop, you have some questions in your mind and you're like, well, what about this? What about that? So then it goes into monitoring. So again, observability, as I said, you're looking at your monitor, um, you're actually looking at your screen and constantly like checking things out versus monitoring. I kind of change it as it's a subset data of observability, of course, because of the observability could be anything. It's pretty large. It could be grand. But you don't need that much data because, again, you're more, more or less the essence is about troubleshooting. Um, and how do I how do I make sure that that could actually lead into alerting as well too? So one thing is, hey, I wanted to understand my issues. Is there any insights that I could take a look at? I need to preserve it for a long time. It could be 30 days um, for Agile Monitor. It is 30 days. Um, and then for some of the other pieces, you wanted to actually see like, hey, I want to see it in a one week time, if an entire day, what happened. Um, two days ago and let's go down. And then of course, then you actually have another smaller subset, which is actually the manifest of the issues, but notification with using alerts. So this is how I kind of actually looked at what observability was when I was creating my product um, and make sure that we have something that the customer can actually look at. And again, they may overlap. Monitoring and, and observability may overlap. And these days I'm also seeing people looking at it as more of a speed thing because um, containers are ephemeral. They actually come and go. Uh, they could actually be really quick. And if I'm actually writing like a quick batch job, like quick job that I, that may actually be for a couple of seconds, I want to actually capture and see that, but I don't need to preserve it for a day or like, you know, and whatnot. So um, that's pretty much what um, we're actually seeing. It's actually about, we're seeing a lot of trend of people thinking that it's more about speed um, versus like, and, and versus like, you know, it's a long-term um, preservation of the data. But again, there you can see like because of the box size, they're not the same. Yeah. So this is just an example that I've actually seen like when I went to like observability like Consortium and um, these summits and whatnot, where people would actually use like multiple different tools. And it could be like one of those um, tools that you've all like used when you're in college, like GNU plot and whatnot. People would actually capture the metrics um, and they may actually snoop the kernel, as I said, um, using eBPF and whatnot pull the information and then actually take a look at it through like new plot and actually see a heat map and all that and uh, there might be actually applications that it might not be the same but they actually do very much similar things and people want to actually see digital footprints really quickly to see what's actually hot what's not and why is it that um, some pieces are causing like you know a SLA slowness what's the bottleneck what's the um, contention so this is where like you know some people would actually utilize observability as well too so there's multiple ways that you could do it visualization is very difficult for observability i'm going to mention that um, because like i said you might want to actually capture the data and visualize it in very, multiple different ways and that's why GNU plot sometimes is actually the best way to do it but again there are a lot of vendors that are trying to actually, are trying to provide you that capability more and more okay so how are people using observability in container mounting enterprise? Uh, we do talk quite a lot of uh, quite a lot to multiple different customers um, daily. Right now, since I'm in the compute side, um, I don't do that anymore. But when I've started, there's a lot of pieces that people didn't understand what containers were. Uh, people are asking for best practice on Kubernetes, and 
every time when I talk to customers, um, they would actually come back and say, this is what we're trying to do. And here's actually one thing that I wanted to kind of like emphasize a little bit more where how containers actually started changing these with IT roles and how people would think about organizations and what's what's their role, what's their, within their role, what are they are supposed to actually do. So here, um, as we all know, this is this is an old diagram and I would actually, I kind of brought this here just to kind of like start the con uh, to provide a little bit of the background where, of course, like as we all know, containers are not infrastructure, even though it is kind of infrastructure, but at the same time, it's not application. So your traditional, if you see in the left hand side, this is the actual stat on the right hand side. If you look, in, look at it through a monitoring tool, let's say your traditional infrastructure monitor tool will not understand containers as part of part of the CPU network or stores and whatnot, um, you know, performance and logs and all that. But at the same time, so if it's not an infrastructure, it's in an application, the APMs will not understand because APMs are embedded inside like the application within the containers and they actually think containers are actually another VM and they, they don't understand the difference. So with that said, there's a big gap in the, in the uh, monitoring piece. And this is pretty common, we all know this, and that's why we have a lot of container monitoring tools today. But the reason why I actually brought this is that I want to kind of actually present this and says, then who monitors the containers or orchestrators? Well, who, whose job it is? Because I just actually told you that it's not application, it's not an infrastructure. This is happening quite often to a lot of customers. They're coming back and say, well, uh, we need to think about it. For IT pros, it's a lot of the piece that they need to actually think about and learn. And for application developers, they're like, well, this is too much. Like we can't just take everything in, even though an application not running could actually be a cluster issue. Right. So, so what happened, what started to actually happen? So here you'll actually see that like container bringing changes, um, the traditional, you had an APM, it still hasn't changed. So you can see that the application monitoring using SDKs, um, understanding like, you know, tracing and all that, they're, they're all the same, right? Uh, but again, microservices and container monitoring started actually coming in because that actually does affect them really significantly. And for the ID pros, uh, instead of just actually looking at like the compute network and storage, you now you actually have the cluster layer or the orchestrator layer, which is a Kubernetes monitoring. Um, and Kubernetes itself also has storage compute and network as well too. I mean, like you have like, you know, the bash and the PVs and whatnot. And then of course you have the container monitoring because you need to also look at the Docker runtime and see like whether they're actually working fine. You need to understand like a cube proxy, <laughs> cube, um, cube list as well too. Even though they're managed, you still have to look at it through the worker nodes. So again, a lot of things are actually coming in. They're starting to actually look at it. It's becoming too much. And of course, because it's containers, it's really granular. So now you're looking into more quantity as well as more layers that you need to look at. So here we're actually starting to see like a lot of stuff is still, sh it's, it's shifting more to the dev devs and DevOps or like SREs. Um, they, would be, they would need to actually look at everything you know, from applications like container monitoring, Kubernetes um, itself, and this goes on, as I just said. And it's becoming a little bit of a burden that we're starting to actually see that more and more with customers and see what we can do. So again, you know, why do they need to actually look at all that? So there's just an example that I have with the triple chain. So I, let's say I have a workload that I just deployed on Kubernetes. And of course, Kubernetes will actually like schedule it. The master nodes will actually schedule it. And then um, they will deploy it, like make sure that if it's a daemon set, like, yeah, I, I would deploy like in you know, a one pod um, per like, you know, VM or agent nodes. Mm -hmm. But the problem is like, if the schedule is broken, if you have the DCC like, you know, corrupting, um, there's a lot of stuff that could actually happen. You may not actually have it scheduled. Or it could be like a kubelet issue as well too. So you guys should look at it. If you see too many pending pods that are happening, as a developer, you'll be like, hey, what happened? Is it, and if it's a pending pod, you know that it's a cluster, but if it's not, then again, your your first thing is like, okay, why isn't it not starting? Is it because my application is not working well? Or is it because like, you know, Kubernetes is, as I just mentioned about schedulers and whatnot, is that the one that's an issue? And and from a developer perspective, it's just too much. You need to really understand everything before you can actually go in. And the other thing that was interesting was when I actually looked at this, I looked at the entire stack and said, well, what's the persona now? Who, who do I actually work in, like, you know, present my monitoring tools for? And there's multiple pieces that we actually started seeing. And of course, you know, like I just mentioned about the IT personnel, 
IT started to actually morph into cloud operators. They could become a DevOps. They call it DevOps and it could be IT person, but they're DevOps, they could be, um, and or they would actually become like central ITs and security. Patterns are all over the place. There's not one correct answer for that with the customers. So you'll see that it's been stretching. It goes beyond multiple different um, areas that it used to be separated through infrastructure and application. Interestingly, I looked at a lot of like Kubernetes documentations, but, and it's interesting they talk about how like, oh no, you, got, you still have the infrastructure separation. Honestly, it's it doesn't work that way. It's very separate. Uh, I, it's actually very, as you can see, like it's blurry among the lines and you can actually do that, but at the same time, it's not always the case. And I've actually seen a couple of customers who would be like, okay, we're the cloud operators. We create the clusters for you. So we already have the security med security is all like set up. Um, we have all these other settings as well too that needs to be turned on. We're going to actually provide it to our development team. The development team now is the cluster owner. They could actually do all the administration work versus in the past you're like, you're the administrator. You give them like rights to actually maybe create a VM and whatnot. But now it's it's to a point where like, no, I'm just going to give you the entire cluster. Or they could actually have some kind of a role where like, hey, yeah, I can actually go back and call and uh, call IT to have them help me with some of the tradition you have. But again, we're talking about like CI, CD, um, like, you know, you're constantly de deploying like, you know, I mean, maybe like you know, hundreds of like, you know, these workloads, right? Like you can't just constantly call IT. So again, this is where like the difficulties are happening, a lot of blurriness and uh, Customers are are trying to figure it, figure these out a lot more better. But again, I've seen like people where like it's like Dev DevOps and and whatnot. Um, so again, I'm focusing on Kubernetes here. Of course, like and if you have an orchestrator that's not Kubernetes, so uh, in Microsoft we do have Service Fabric as well too. So let's say like you know if you have like multiple different um, type of orchestrators, um, it doesn't um, it's similar, but it's not always the same. I just want to say that. Um, and uh, here you'll see that this is actually the big four buckets that I put in as a stack. And of course, you can see that there's a lot going on here. So from the top of the stack, it's the workload from the application point of view. Yes. Um, what's what type of metrics logs or health inventory you really need? Um, I just put a lot of uh, the major ones, but of course, it does not just this is not the only thing that you would need to look at. There's going to be a lot more that you may actually want to go into. Of course, custom metrics is another one that I didn't put in. But again, that's something that you would define. But again, some kind of a major ones that is pretty much default. These are actually some of the pieces. Um, so you see a lot of stuff here, um, like in terms of like exit controllers, liveness, readiness, probes, um, logs, metrics, um, health, whatnot. And you can see that this is a lot of pieces that you need to look at. It's not just one or two things. Um, and you look into the orchestrator, even the orchestrator, there's a lot of multiple different pieces that are in there. Are they encrypted? Like, you know, in terms of etcd, um, is there something that I, I um, that the schedules are actually properly working, um, but not? Um, and then, of course, you have the, from the orchestrator point of view, um, this is an interesting piece, like, you know, you have the node conditions. The node could be healthy, like the VM could be healthy, but like if Kubernetes doesn't think that the node is healthy, it would actually call out and says the conditions are bad, so I'm not going to schedule any more pods on that VM. So you still need, even though the infrastructure is good, you still need to look at the orchestrator um, and you need to do it vice versa. And again, that affects the workload, like I just said, hey, I can't schedule my workload. Um, and of course, like container runtime is always uh, very um, pieces as well too, like, you know, Docker and on that. And on the right hand side, what I did is I actually put in some of like the major tools. Of course, this is not it. There's a lot more. Um, and you can see that there's there's quite a lot that um, is out there, and a lot of them just all like Linux based. But uh, because containers, um, interestingly, we found that a lot of customers who are using Linux are container customers, or vice versa. Windows, on the other hand, is very different. And I could talk about that later as well too. But uh, so here, like as you can see here, like you know, I put in a lot of um, tools. I've seen a lot of ABPF uh, embedded products out there. Um, TCP dumps, the list goes on. And of course, I didn't put in Prometheus because Prometheus is a product, it's not like a tool. So that's that. But you can see like some of the major tools that you have, like, you know, top, like, and you could use that as well too and go through C groups and whatnot. So quite a lot of stuff that you could do hands on. But again, like I said, it's a lot that you need to actually look at. And that's why, you know, monitoring tools are now out there from multiple vendors. So one thing that I wanted to actually talk about is that we just talked about containers, uh, monitor, um, container microservices monitoring and whatnot. But the reality is that 
you're not always going to be doing just containers, right? Like, it, it, yes, it, the containers are important, but as a development experience, applications is beyond a platform. It's beyond Kubernetes. So I would actually have um, Kubernetes um, and another entity, like a database, like external storage, uh, database services. Um, it could be like um, like a memcache, like you know, Redis, um, and this goes on. Like in you know, other services, you might be actually utilizing in addition to Kubernetes as well too. Even though Kubernetes can actually run all those, I've actually seen patterns where people are going beyond just Kubernetes. And of course, if, when you're talking about because it's microservices and there's actually that ease, you have multiple customers also utilizing multiple different languages. Um, so I would actually have multiple teams writing services in their own um, different languages but make sure that these services could be grouped to using functions. So you have a function that actually tr triggers all these services, runs it, and then actually comes back. And again, um, and it, if, if you could see on the right hand side, you'll see like varieties of um, different services deployed on different type of platforms, such as containers, and it could be VMs as well too. Um, it could be databases and this goes on. Again, these varies, right? Um, so one thing that um, I wanted to kind of mention is that, yes, we do talk quite a lot about containers and microservices, but again, if you really look at the real development experience, which I'm pretty sure you all have been um, into, um, it's not about just one thing. It's actually, it goes actually beyond that. And I've seen tendencies where people only talk about like, uh, like, you know, Kubernetes, but again, I just wanted to kind of show you that, like, you know, we did actually talk about the depths of Kubernetes, um, how how deep it is, um, but again, we also need to talk about how, like, you know, why we need to actually look at um, because, again, applications a lot longer, and you need a cohesive view and see that, hey, did my workload really work well? Um, did I did I actually have a congestion on the databases because I'm talking to a database and it was my query fine? Um, was it a type of query that I need to actually change so that my SLA in terms of my workload is fine as well too? And one more thing that I wanted to kind of mention is that um, as I've actually seen people, how they maintain states for their microservices, um, they um, the patterns that I've actually seen was is either it's on a database, external database that I just talked about. It could be NoSQL or regular SQL. Um, we've seen it at pieces with Redis um, cache as well too. So people will be caching like, you know, mem cache as well, memory cache as well too. And then also, like, you know, if you're using service fabric, it would be like reliable collection. So it's actually a stateful um, platform. You would actually put the state on the entire platform itself as well. Um, and, you know, multiple pieces, like you still need to understand all that. Um, and it's like I said, you know, uh, those are actually pretty much missing quite a lot uh, when I look at monitoring tools these days. And Again, those are some of the pieces I'm kind of seeing a little bit of a trend where the monitoring companies are starting to realize that a little bit more like you see here with this diagram. So just wanted to talk about um, monitoring vendors um, that I've actually seen out there. There's a lot. Um, so uh, you'll actually see like, you know, APM and tracing um, like Dynatrace, AppDynamics, New Relics. They're actually all really good companies. And of course, I've put in some like soft uh, pieces. Zipkin's a little bit old, but like, you know, you see like Jaeger Zipkin, um, which comes from the CNCF um, and they're open source. Of course, Microsoft, so it's Application Insights, uh, Sysdig, Datadog, uh, WeWorks. There's multiple different ones that are actually there. So I forgot to add Tanzu in there. Um, so if you, if you guys know Tanzu, Tanzu is another one that's coming up. Um, pretty um, good and uh, it's from VMware. Um, I've actually, it, this couple of months, it's been really um, great out there. I've seen it where um, they're trying to actually encompass all this and also provide an insights. Um, and what that means is that, then um, I might, I'll, I'll touch base a little bit later more about this, uh, is that um, a lot of these companies realize like um, how like, you know, particular, they're starting to understand. Uh, one, one thing I would say is that they're starting to understand what the patterns are of how like, you know, Kubernetes or container monitoring should actually be. And they do change quite often. And even if you actually look at Kubernetes, how we actually captured it when we when I did container insights, and it's still the same as that, uh, we went through C Advisor. Originally it was C Advisor. Um, and then it actually morphed and changed um, within Kubernetes. And then it actually changed into the metrics API. 
So you see like even three times it actually changes, but even metrics API is based upon C advisor. Um, so uh, even Kubernetes platform itself is trying to um, grasp and under understand how to monitor it properly. Um, and also like, you know, the monitoring companies like you see here are also trying to actually grasp that as well to better and saying how to actually keep track of it. Um, so here we're actually seeing a lot of these companies keeping uh, keeping a hold of um, how uh, Kubernetes works, but at the same time, um, and I put it inside the Kubernetes infrastructure and whatnot, Prometheus. A lot of people, a lot of companies have embraced Prometheus. Um, so let's say like, you know, if you look at like, you know, a good example, New Relic or like, you know, Datadog, and if you look at their documentations, they're very heavily into uh, Prometheus. Um, and they've been embedded um, Prometheus as well too. So Influx DB, another one, they actually are time series database. They've actually done quite a lot of that as well too. So if you actually go into their uh, agent, which is Telegraph, and by the way, Telegraph is free and it's really good. Um, Telegraph itself has a Prometheus plugin that you could pull the data um, and uh, without like having a Prometheus server. It's pretty good, and it's one of the, the way that they actually create Telegraph is it's a plugin model, so you could actually turn on bits that Telegraph already has inside their binary. So Telegraph agent it's a, is a binary, but uh, you could go into GitHub, take a look at it, and then see um, what what uh, what type of uh, plugins they get have, and you could you know turn it on. And there's an output plugin, so you could actually output it into whatever entity you want. It doesn't have to be just for Influx, but um, Influx actually creates that that way. Uh, so a lot of customers, uh, because Prometheus is, again, it's CNCF, um, it is community driven. The community is pretty fast at putting in new metrics. Um, they're really good at actually obtaining it and maintaining it. So a lot of the vendors, as you can see here, are leveraging it really significantly. So if you talk to these vendors, you're like, well, what do you do inside? Like they'll pretty much talk about Prometheus, um, interestingly. Um, but there are companies who are not doing that. Like Sysdig is a really good one where um, I mentioned about eBPF um, earlier. They embed eBPF. Originally, they have been doing eBPF, but more kernel module, and then they actually switched a little bit to eBPF now, which is a lot more lighter to um, snoop the kernel um, movements and pull all the data. And originally, Sysdig was a networking company. So they understood all the networking packets, snooped it, understood all that. So they utilized that technology into the container world. And now you will see like Sysdig presenting that as well too. So um, so you'll see like trends. And by the way, container insights, yes, I've added Prometheus in there too, so you'll see that. But um, within there, there is actually a trend that um, we go into um, within like, you know, how we're actually capturing the uh, the open source community um, and how the vendors are actually struggling to keep up with it because it is, it is very big it's huge um, and the metrics let's say like even for node i i could have easy like uh, with the node exporter for prometheus i could have easy like 100 metrics right there and by the way you don't need all 100 metrics because that could actually cost you but um that's how many of the metrics out there is and especially with the um Kubri Kubri like um Kube metrics. So again, you know, these just I'm just actually presenting you some of like the major ones. I'm pretty sure a lot of them are actually coming up. Um, and again, you know, some of the new ones, um, like for example, the VMware Tanzu seems to be very promising. It is multi-cluster, so it's not just for VMware. Um, it actually looks at multiple different uh, or tools as well too. And of course, um, observability, you can't miss Honeycomb. Honeycomb is actually really good. Um, and they have proper um, you know, like dependency mapping and whatnot. It's pretty robust. So that's another really good tool. So one thing that the reason why I'm actually introducing all of this monitoring tool, I know I kind of dabbled a little bit on this page, but is that um, honestly, there's not one pay, one monitoring company that actually does everything really good. Like I just presented to you earlier on the development experience. They're trying. And I and me myself like you know, was part of being part of the monitoring organization. It is hard. How do you court like them and how do you put it together? And things are changing. They're moving so rapidly because the communities are uh, spreading out. And if you haven't seen it uh, recently um, with CNCF, there's a SIG for observability now. Um, so again, you know, it is a vast area. It's upcoming and 
um, it may actually come in a little bit more like, you know, settle down. But again, you know, people are starting to actually see how um, it's it, again, development experience is changing because of all this. And that's why like, you know, monitoring tends to actually like is one step behind for a good reason. Try to actually keep up with it. So. So um, just as an example with Prometheus, as I just mentioned, um, this is Container Insights. Um, for those who know, um, it is um, an like, out-of-the-box Azure uh, monitoring tool. Uh, if you go in and uh, install AKS, which is Azure Kubernetes Services, uh, you could actually turn on an add-on called Container Insights, which turns it on. Like, do you want monitoring? Yes or no. Uh, you can turn it on and uh, it would light, light up um, Container Insights. Container Insights is um, basically an entire monitoring tool that goes from basically uh, from uh, platform. We would capture all the information from plat platform, um, Kubernetes, uh, Docker, and then also like Kubernetes and workload all together. And there are pieces that customers were asking us, even with the amount of data that we are capturing. And just kind of give you some context. A lot of the, these data is actually they're they're really chatty. They actually give out a lot of um, a lot of metrics or logs. And as you know, Azure is a subscription based um, product because we're a cloud provider. Um, if you capture all those data, it's really expensive. And we've been kind of like containing the data. And Prometheus, on the other hand, is a very different um, tool, um, where it's like you would have your own server and uh, you would install uh, Prometheus. So it's and again, the scalability is one big issue too that I will talk about later. But pieces, uh, it's whatever data that you actually put in. Um, you already have the capex already. You've already purchased it. You know like how much it's going to like. And since you already purchased it up front, you could put as much data as you want. So a lot of customers we've actually seen where they would just turn everything on, and uh, uh, they'll start actually lighting up Grafana. Um, they don't use a Prometheus UI, they're more Grafana, so people light up Grafana because there's a lot of Grafana also like, uh, you know, templates out there that you could just leverage and like mold it and change it and utilizing PromQ, which is a lot simpler as well too. Um, and that's something that, you know, uh, we, and people were asking for more granularity, especially like I said, custom metrics, like how do I do my custom metrics? Uh, how do I actually capture that? And that's another reason why we've introduced, we've introduced like um, Prometheus integration within Container Insights. Again, this is something, again, it's a trend that a lot of vendors are actually doing. We did it as well too. One thing that we did that also helped the customer was, if you look at like a lot of customers, um, let's say you're running AKS and you want to do Prometheus, Prometheus people would actually put Prometheus server inside the same cluster. So if the Kubernetes cluster goes down, uh, Prometheus goes down as well too, so you don't know what happened later on. And that was a little bit of an issue. Um, so, um, and Prometheus, like I said, you know, scalability is one thing. And of course, they, they're they trying to do Thanos and they're trying to do all this other pieces as well too to expand Prometheus. Uh, but again, you know, right now at this moment, like that, that's been an issue. Uh, we had a customer like, you know, a telecom one that um, had pod information. They said in one hour, it filled up Prometheus. So you can see uh, that it could actually be an issue at, in an enterprise company. So here, what we did was we unified that and said, we will collect all the data um, that Prometheus has as long as they expose the endpoints. Endpoints exposure could be through a node using the node exporter. Um, it could also be through like pod annotation, as you can see here. Um, what's that? You know, like, you know, if you actually turn it on and say, here's actually my pods, like go pick it up. You could actually pick it up. It could be HTTP or HTTPS, doesn't matter. Um, and then lastly, any services, like let's say I run a service, my web service, you know, on top of like Kubernetes and I expose my endpoints. And that's another thing that, uh, uh, you know, you could actually do. And these are actually the three major pieces that Prometheus provides. So if the customer already knows how to do Prometheus, this is pretty simple. Um, and some customers have come back to us saying, well, I can't pick up Prometheus data. And I said, well, have you embedded SDKs, Prometheus SDKs? Because Prometheus is, except for exporters, um, there are SDK based, right? So you need to actually do that. And uh, some people didn't understand that um, Prometheus is not a turnkey, you don't have to do anything um, tool. So, uh, but anyways, long story short, uh, our agent, which is the log analytics agent, will understand those. It's a config that level. You don't need a permission server like I um, mentioned. 
um, and it will collect the data. It, as long as it's exposed, you could do whitelisting and blacklisting of what metrics you want and you don't want. Um, and then it would actually go into log analytics. Um, log analytics is, is our um, large um, database that is created for analytics. Uh, and there we collect both metrics and logs and health statuses, uh, events and whatnot. Um, and you could do correlations uh, based upon that as well. And uh, within here, uh, we've also created a connector from log analytics. You could do an Azure portal dashboarding. So let's say you do a query and you create a uh, dashboard UI. You could bring it up into uh, Azure portal UI and then actually pin to the dashboard. Or uh, what you could also do is um, connect that into Grafana for directly from log analytics and then present it on Grafana as well too. Um, and it would be, and instead of prompt QL, because of course your database is now into log analytics, you would need to use a crystal query language to present that, but that's something that you could do. And of course, uh, Azure Monitor already has alerting, so you could actually hook it up into um, alerting that way. So this is one example of how vendors are utilizing Prometheus um, to like expand and help the customers and make it more uh, lesser uh, man management and all that. And a lot of customers, especially enterprise, are looking for that as well too, saying like, is there some way that you could actually do something that we don't have to manage the monitoring tool? And of course, you know, you see the other vendors that I just talked about, they're all they're all like that as well. Okay. And uh, by the way, if you guys are interested, I, could, I guess I could actually show that a little bit later, but there's a video that I done at Azure Friday last year. So uh, you'll you could actually see all that here as well, too. So again, I just wanted to kind of emphasize I talked about it in the beginning. Microservice is a distributed system. Uh, one thing that we need to understand is that like Yes, uh, we are using containers, we're using Kubernetes, but one thing that it's still really important is we still have to have the um, idea that it's application centric because it is all about application. Of course, we do have infrastructure like you know, the VMs and the clusters, I mean, the orchestrators and whatnot, but again, we need to actually, that's, that's one thing that, the main thing is about as a customer is, do I have a proper reliability and availability um, so that my application could run properly and it finishes? And uh, that's one of the biggest piece that I just wanted to kind of provide a lot. Um, a lot of people do, uh, if you know distributed systems, you understand how like reliability and availabilities are, you know, having the replicas and partitions and all that. Um, you need to also think about that a lot more when you're actually looking into Kubernetes. Um, and that's one of the piece that I would actually say performance and capacity definitely because you are sharing an environment when you're using um, Kubernetes. Um, and this is always the case, how do I load balance it? Uh, do like a PLB, like you know, placement and load balancing among the VMs. Um, how do I actually properly like you know reallocate them and whatnot? Because uh, when you actually do multiple failovers, sometimes that could be a bottleneck, and we've seen um, where a VM went down because of that as well too. Um, and of course, you know, over subscriptions, um, you might have actually done like you know um, some kind of like you know like putting your limits too high than your actual. Um, VMs, um, those are actually some of the pieces that you really need to think about. How do I actually do proper capacity planning? Um, because again, you are limited in a certain VM size, right? Like I didn't know it was a VM. Um, and make sure that you're not hogging um, the system pods, like the kube system pods, because kube system pods, if it dies, that's another issue as well too, okay? The other thing that I kind of wanted to emphasize a lot more is the application model and application lifecycle. Because again, like I said, these um, systems like the containers and the Kubernetes or orchestrators, they're there to serve applications. And in that case, like I need to understand what's my application model and what's my application lifecycle. The reason I'm kind of honing on application model is because in that way, um, you could actually understand like, um, how do I tune Kubernetes? There's a lot of code tuning that you need to do in Kubernetes. Like, you know, do I, should I use a service mesh? Like, is, is, or should I just do an ingress controller? Um, how do I actually make the flow properly in terms of all these packets, um, the pods, like what type of authentication is going on? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you kind of wanted to actually look into in terms of like what the application model would be and what the application lifecycle should actually become. And one of the piece that I, the reason I kind of put this here is because um, because it's microservice and I said like, you know, monolithic was one big application and now you broke, broke it down and carve it into these smaller pieces and you have that flexibility. Um, whatever you've added or whatever you actually um, installed as an application has um, eventually will alter a lot. So when people do use Kubernetes and they install it, they would do some tuning. But when they actually did the tuning, um, 
their tuning may not actually suffice in like you know a few months because the application has actually changed and altered because of the multiple CI/CD that you've actually done. So again, you know, some of the pieces to kind of be careful of is what's the drift that you would actually have in terms of application, and what's the and when actually you know like creating an application um, on Kubernetes, am I actually doing the right thing? Because we also see a lot of customers who come back and say, well. Uh, I've deployed an application, but I don't know why this is not doing what what, what I'm expecting it to do. Um, and again, you know, people need to understand that a little bit better on application modeling and whatnot. And just letting you know, like Kubernetes doesn't have a model. Um, other orchestrators do. They're they're a little bit op opinionated in that way. I mean, Kubernetes is opinionated in some certain way, but they're not as opinionated as others, where they're like, this is a model, you must follow it. So again, you know. Just um, presenting that as well too, and that's another thing that we are seeing a lot of customers struggling. Where, okay, am I doing the right thing with an application now? Um, and how how do I actually do it? And sometimes like having a flexibility is good. Sometimes it's bad because it, it, it you don't have that like good guideline of is this the right thing to do? Okay. So this is my last slide now. Um, so what to see in monitoring observability tools? And I kind of mentioned quite a lot of stuff already in the beginning, but kind of put a little bit more there together now and say like, you know, one thing is, like I said, you know, you're serving uh, a particular purpose, like you're trying to actually serve. Um, so application lifecycle is very key. And again, this is um, a different product. It's not like something that you can separate between infrastructure and whatnot. So again, application lifecycle with the platform, it, it, whether it's Kubernetes, um, infra, um, like Docker or container D, whatever. Um, those are actually very important that you need to actually look at. Um, and again, uh, cohes cohesiveness is a big thing. As I mentioned, it's beyond um, a single application now. Uh, application is beyond a single product. It's not like, okay, one product could actually do everything and I just need to know one thing. It's not anymore. Uh, you need to understand all of it together and then see the full picture. And how what, what type of tools are there that would actually provide me that full picture from end to end. Um, that's a big thing, and um, that is pretty hard to actually see. There are some tools that are really good that actually does it, like somewhat of a tracing type of tools. But again, if you really want to see everything like, okay, yeah, this device went down. Um, this is why it's actually um, giving me a timeout. Um, it's becoming, it's providing me an error messages and whatnot. Those, you know, I don't actually see anything that's actually that um, nicely done in terms of the entire, uh, like, you know, end to end. Um, correlations, again, you know, similar to what I said, you need correlations. Let's say like, you know, why is it that my applications are not running? Oh, I realized that, hey, you know what? The pod pods are pending um, extremely, so maybe that's the reason why. Let me go and, you know, look into the cluster uh, and figure it out. Um, so a lot of the tools right now, I mean, including Prometheus, um, a lot of them are, and a lot of the monitoring vendors, they're using, um, time series database. A lot of them are. But the thing that you need to understand is that not all time series database are equal. They're not. And we found out when we were actually doing a couple of testings with different products um, is that the cardinality is missing or scalability is missing. Again, I mentioned about how chatty um, Prometheus is and how chatty like, you know, containers and all these are. Uh, you're going to run out of space. And uh, cardinality is actually one of the biggest things that we realized that let's say if you want to do histogram or whatnot, like, you know, um, some some time series database will not actually do well. So again, be careful um, there. Um, and then also like, you know, one of the things that I wanted to also mention is that as you know, we just talked about like, you know, um, observability SIG that CNCF has. Um, they're trying to actually unify the metrics. So like we had the open metrics and then open telemetry which is all good. And a lot of vendors are going to go into that or it's either like what the platform is providing. So the platform would be presenting you the logs and metrics. And vendors, my monitoring vendors would need to pick that up and then present them. So the trend that you're going to see even further is that, well, it's great that you're showing me metrics, logs and health and all that events and all that. But like I said, it's a lot. There's so much that you need to look at. And how could I actually look at all of that? and then determine whether it's healthy or not. Like, is my application healthy? Is my cluster healthy? It's a, it's a lot of stuff. So this is where, like, you know, I talk about aggregated insights. How do I aggregate this and interpret it? And um, and you need to actually go through multiple different layers. So you need to look at it and say, yeah, this is the reason why this, this cluster is healthy. And if it's not, I'm going to tell you, right? You need something like that. 
Um, and interpretation, um, again, this actually, if you're actually more focused on application, sometimes the application model, like I said, what if the application drifted? You need to understand the application model and the monitoring tool needs to be very opinionated. I mean, it needs to actually follow that opinion and then interpret and says, this is what we actually saw and here's what it is. Um, and based upon that, like, you know, eventually you would need to have some kind of a machine learning pattern that would provide you and says, well, this is what we saw, so we're actually going to notify you. This is actually something that, you know, application is doing, even though it's not causing an error, it's not crashing. Um, those are some of the pieces that people start to understand would actually start um, need, need to go into. So there are products like Datadog started doing that. There's other products as a tool. Gradually, they're starting to actually do all this as well. And lastly, like I talked a lot about Kubernetes, but of course, serverless is coming up as well, too. There's a lot of serverless products out there. Lambda is another one, but um, so they're more functions. But um, let's say uh, like, you know, serverless Kubernetes is another buzzword that I hear a lot and managed Kubernetes. AKS is a managed Kubernetes. So when you kind of look at that, well, what, what is monitoring those observability going to be? Are they going to change? Some pieces suggest that they're, they are definitely going to change because like, let's say, um, and let me explain what managed Kubernetes are, like managed Kubernetes are, um, if you look at the industry, like, you know, DCP or like AWS, like EKS or even AKS, um, it's all about managing the master nodes and uh, making sure your VMs are healthy, like, you know, a little bit of a self-healing and scalability and whatnot. But still, you still need to look at your VM, like you still own the VM. Um, so that's pretty much what it is versus a serverless is. Um, and again, I'm going to be really frank, the serverless um, definition is very different with everybody. So there's not one good definition that says this is what the de facto is. So I'm going to say that, but uh, with what I'm actually, um, you know, hearing from most of the customers of what they are, it's about like a platform that they could just run their application and it can be opinionated utilizing an application model. So with that said, like, you know, how, how is the monitoring and observability changing? Actually, not really, except for that the infrastructure piece may not be the case. Because um, again, um, and it might be more observability driven rather than monitoring, um, where you would have the platform starting to feed off more of these observability information than your monitoring tools, um, pulling that information out. So again, you might actually see a shift of from like, you know, hey, a monitoring tool into the platform, imb embedding into more into the platform of all these um, capabilities. But again, you, you know, these are some of the pieces that I was kind of looking at when I was looking into like, you know, monitoring observability. So again, um, this is pretty much what I have, but um, there might be more that I might be missing. But again, you know, just kind of like, you know, bear in mind, it is um, this entire container uh, one that is really rapid. As you can see, it's really like in a few years, um, and then we already have this like big craze about Kubernetes. If you go to a customer side, like for us, they're all about like, how do I do Kubernetes? And we would ask them why, and they don't know. Um, so again, long story short, uh, you know, it's it's moving target. Um, it is difficult, but again, just bear in mind that you may actually stitch tools, um, and you may actually, uh, you know, need to actually do some manual pieces, but. Um, Again, you'll see that there's so much trend that uh, monitoring organizations are doing. But again, this is just my, um, you know, pieces that I just wanted you guys to actually understand and also like the trend and all that as well, too. Okay. So again, you know, yes. thank Sorry. No, I just won't say that we are run out of time, so uh, we need to give you enough time to, to guys to, to switch to another session. Okay. No, and this was the last slide, so thank you very much.